Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending our virtual panel discussion today. I'm Naomi Clayman, and I head customer engineering uh, for financial services based out of New York. As my side project, my passion project, I lead I'm Remarkable for cloud customers in New York. I'm so excited to be here today as part of I Am Remarkable Week. I Am Remarkable Week is a global initiative that strives to empower everyone, but particularly women in underrepresented groups to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. Today, we're gonna to have a conversation about why we must think more intentionally about integrating DEI into every part of our work. I'm thrilled to welcome Janet Kennedy, Vice President of Google Cloud North America, and Tony Safoyan, President and CEO of SADA, in an engaging conversation about how to foster DEI throughout, throughout an organization. Welcome, Janet and Tony. So glad to have you here today. Um, we'd like, you know, if we could start off, it'd be great, Tony, if you can share a little bit about your background and how you got here today. Thank you so much for the intro, uh, Naomi. Uh, nice to see you, Janet. And, and it's such an honor to be here presenting during I Am Remarkable Week. Um, a little bit about uh, myself and, and Sada. So um, Sada is, a, is an amazing story. It's an, it's an American story of, uh, of, a, of a business founded by immigrants that was fortunate enough to run into uh, uh, Google Enterprise in 2006. And as we celebrate our 21 years in business, uh, for the last 15, we've been partnered very, very closely with Google and Google Cloud and uh, really exclusively with Google Cloud for the last two and a half years. And so much of our work together has influenced my thinking, our strategy, and the culture within the organization that I'm extremely proud of and I'm super excited to share with everyone today. Great. Janet, can you share a little bit about your background? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony's company, Sada, is one of our biggest and best uh, Google Cloud partners, so I'm, I was really excited to be asked to host this with you. Uh, I'm going to share a background that's more personal, uh, not really my career background. Uh, if you think about me being here, I'm probably one of the least likely people that would be on a panel like this today. Uh, when I grew up, I grew up pretty much in an all-female household. I have three sisters, my mom, my father and mother were teachers. Uh, my mother stayed at home once she had four little girls at home. And when I was eight years old, my father went to Milan and uh, had a heart attack and passed suddenly. So I literally grew up with all-female home. We had, uh, my mom was not working. We had no insurance. Uh, you know, teachers don't get social security. So you would think that would be a really, really tough situation and not one that someone like me would be in a very heavily dominated tech environment. But my mom is remarkable. And so basically when this happened to us as a family, an all girls family, uh, she basically said education is the way to get yourself up and out of the situation that we were in. And I can tell you on the day that my little sister got her graduate degree, we threw a party. So all four of us had gotten both undergraduate and graduate degrees. And my little sister got her final one. And I remember the day we put eight diplomas on the table and the party wasn't for my sister, but it was for my mom because it was on that day, my mom, that was my mom got her dream, her life's dream is that she was able to get us through. And so again, I wanted to share that story for people that were out there that says, wow, look at, you know, Tony's CEO of a company, I'm vice president of Google Cloud. You know, you, you think that there must've been an easy path to get there. And in reality, all of us come from very different circumstances. And uh, I just think that when you have uh, strong women, strong allies, strong mentors in your life, you can do amazing things. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Thank, thank you, Janet. I know, Tony, you were surrounded by strong women. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, actually one of the, the co-founders of SADA itself was, was my mother. And uh, even before SADA, she um, came to this country, of course, not knowing the language, um, learned the language, got a job in accounting. But when her uh, organization that she was working for was going to actually shut down in L.A. and move to the East Coast, she didn't want to do that. So she basically stayed home for a while and tinkered on this is 1989. Uh, we had just bought our first house in this country, had no furniture, but we had like a three thousand dollar computer, I remember, which is you know, my dad's influence coming from tech. And uh, uh, she just she just tinkered and just figured out graphic design and and literally from nothing started to 
do the or like the early days of typesetting and graphic design for printers and stuff like that. So she was she had this entrepreneurial spirit. I just remember her working so hard, so many hours to sort of um, make an economic contribution to the family and to make sure, of course, I had everything I needed to to uh, to meet my needs and the needs of the family. But also her sisters were very, very much the same way. I was always surrounded by my you know, my grandmother, who was extremely uh, powerful and strong and 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 um, just a matriarch of the family. My mom and her two sisters, my cousin, who's also grew up like my, my sibling. We were both only children. Um, she's a principal at a high school now, but just always surrounded by extremely capable, powerful women. And um, that was both sort of a positive experience for me, but also I think it sort of missed that expectations that for some reason, I believe that that was like the norm and that was, it just happened automatically, right? For, for women, and I, as I worked in tech, and you know, tech as Janet knows, hasn't always been the most conducive environment to um, historically underrepresented groups and, and women as well. And, um, and, and I learned that, that there's so much of what we do daily that we take for granted that um, tech really needed to change. And it was really like the influence of working so closely with, with Janet, but also with Kara Lee and, and Nina Harding and Amy Catalano and all these female leaders at Google that over the years opened my eyes to not only the challenge ahead, but the opportunity uh, to make a real impact on our whole industry. Cool. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for sharing. Um, if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to, to deep dive into the importance of diversity, inclusion, and equity. As food for thought, I'd like to share a slide that we showed during our I Am Remarkable workshop to the participants, and I'd like to get your perspective on that. Um, Janet, perhaps you, you can share the importance of women uh, and diversity on as being part of a board and boards of companies that you're part of. Yeah, for sure. Um, for the women that are out there that are qualified for boards, and there's many, many of you, you probably don't even think that this is something you should do. Uh, it is so important uh, to go for either a private or public board. Uh, and for three reasons. Number one, you know, we will never break through the divide until more people look like us, more diverse. And it's not just women, it's also underrepresented uh, 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 backgrounds. But the other piece is from a board perspective, the data says, and you can see it here, it's literally fact, it's financial performance, 53% greater performance in companies that, um, that have women on boards versus not having women on boards. And so the numbers are there. But then the other piece is I think you need to have both in boards, both in uh, companies, in your sales teams with your customers, you need to have people that look like us. And in and, and, in the North America, right now, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know we're slightly higher women than men. And if we show up as a sales team, as an engineering team, you're looking at building new products. If you show up with people that don't look like your customers, it's much more unlikely that you're gonna be build something that they get excited about. And so I feel strongly about it for multiple reasons, but I would uh, just encourage people that are listening today that if you've never thought about being on a public board or a private board, and uh, I, I would encourage you to do so, uh, and go out as many organizations can help women and underrepresented uh, uh, employees to understand what it takes to get on a board and to get some alliance to get there. Tony? We had a really interesting evolution over the last five years. You know, we deliberately went out as, as the business was getting larger and more complex, deliberately building uh, an executive team that had, you know, capabilities and came from backgrounds that we didn't have at SADA. And I was really both proud of the evolution of the executive team, but also fast following that, our board. And we're a private company. We're not as sort of regulated under the same level of maybe scrutiny as public companies, but we deliberately from day one went out and um, our first two independent board members were women. And today, half of our board is, uh, from historically underrepresented groups, including women. And basically half of our executive team is the same. And um, what really changed my thinking about this, outside of just the impact and influence of, of, of our relationship with Google Cloud and amazing leaders there, but uh, 
I first saw a speaker named Franz Johansson at a Google event, I remember in Atlanta, where he was speaking on, um, based on his book called The Medici Effect, on all the, all the research and uh, all the studies around how diversity generates a much more creative, collaborative, innovative environment that ultimately translates to real competitive advantage for those companies who um, have that composition. And, and, and that really got me thinking like, yes, absolutely. We have to do these things to, because it's what the market expects to some degree. It's what our customers expect, but for it to stick and be a long-term sustainable um, strategy, I think it's, it's just very clear that diverse companies do better. Diverse boards add more um, influence and input into um, the strategy and the execution of, of every company that they um, that they advise, and um, you know it was just it was just su super eye opening that this book that Franz Johansson wrote in 2004, which if you think about it is sort of way ahead of its time, became such a fabric of of how we think, but also really came out of a Google Cloud event itself. So it's guided our thinking. Um, our company would not culturally be what it is today if we didn't have the type of board that we have and the type of executive team that we have. And of course, creating that type of environment is super important to me. Yeah, I'll just jump in uh, quickly. I, I do sit on a public board of a railroad, of all things, another non, uh, there's not very many female there often. Um, but what I would tell you is when you are on a public board, and Tony, you probably feel the same way about your board, you get as much uh, learning, insight as you give. And so while it is extra time, and I know particularly as women, we often talk about, you know, we're in the crunch, particularly that sandwich generation when you have young kids and elderly parents, which we're all dealing with today. Uh, but I still would challenge you because the time that you give into a public board, I get that much back and just learning, understanding what's going on in the world, the connections that you make. Um, and I also, I personally feel for me, it's something that I'm doing for other women that are going to come behind me because we need more women on board. We need more underrepresented, um, underrepresented uh, talent on boards because of the reasons Tony and I just talked about. And I'll also say one last thing. I, I think for any organizations that are listening, it's not always the case that you need for every single seat on your board for it to be an experienced professional board member. What I'm very proud of is when we give somebody their first ever board seat, mm -hmm. first ever board role that they've ever served. Just creating that opportunity is a, a tremendous way to make an impact. That's great. That, that's an amazing perspective. I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I would have thought that we that members of the board were giving to the company. The fact that you. Um, Flip the coin is, is an amazing perspective I'd never thought about. Um, I guess the two of you are so passionate towards DEI, and, and I guess that's one of the, apart from sales, uh, that's a major connection between the two of you, um, <laughs> as well as I Am Remarkable. And to date, we've had over 800 organizations who joined I Am Remarkable, among them Google clients and partners. And, and I'm proud to share that I'm one of the I Am Remarkable facilitators, and I've successfully rolled out I Am Remarkable to companies um, like like Colgate and various other ones. Um, I've also successfully, I've, I've also had fun doing I Remarkable for, for Sada themselves. Um, <laughs> I guess, Jen, and I know you're familiar with a lot of the cases that we've got, customer cases where we've rolled out I Remarkable. Perhaps you could share with us why it's important to Google taking I Remarkable to our clients and to our partners. Yes, absolutely. When, when I think about um, our CEO, Sundar often talks about, you know, as Googlers, we need to do be useful, be helpful. And when you see a program that we ran internally with such success, why would we not take it to our customers? Um, I, what we found, and I actually brought a few, a paper, a few uh, quotes here because I wanted to read them. Um, from these are customer quotes from us running sessions for them. Glasgow Smith Klein said, I really enjoy the group conversation. It's powerful, but the point that I really hit me, it also made me challenge my own unconscious biases. I thought that was so strong. 
at HBEC, they talked about how often it, how awesome it is to understand the value to create your own personal brand. And I thought that was a great one. And then uh, there's a couple other uh, customer quotes. I have a whole bunch of them here. But the fact that CEOs, CFOs, CXOs often attended this first because they want to understand it. I think, uh, Tony, I think this is your experience. And then from there, they wanted to roll it out to the entire organization. It's just so powerful to me that it's a, it's an area that, that Google can be helpful, can share the learnings that we have. And then I do want to make a comment, and I'll pass it to you, Tony. You know, I'm so thankful for partners like SADA because the, if we can truly get scale, this is true for Google Cloud and our business. You know, our partner ecosystem is the scale of our company. But when they want to take a program like that and scale it, that's when you get the, the multiplier of the positive effect that will go global. Absolutely. And, and perhaps, Tony, I know SADA is one of our major partner companies. I know you've got major plans with I'm Remarkable. Perhaps you could share with us how, first of all, how your I'm Remarkable journey started. Let's start with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe it started when actually it was Noreen Galstein, who's our chief marketing officer, went to a program and was so influenced by that that she shared with the executive team and then went and sort of got certified herself, right, to be a trainer on the program. And then shortly um, after that, a few months after that, Naomi, um, you came in and did the training for um, for our folks within SADA, and that was attended by dozens of folks. Uh, the feedback of that was just phenomenal. There's also some local stuff going on in Southern California. I think it was Meg Tucker, who's a sales leader here. It's Southern California Enterprise, which we're, where we're headquartered. And there were some live events around this um, pre-COVID. That was just really uh, fantastic to see. And, you know, the concept of how we could scale this, not just internally within SADA, really started to kind of come together between those conversations and I had friends, Johansson, on, 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 the, on the SADA podcast. And sort of those two thoughts came together and said, look, we, we actually have potentially a much bigger role to play, not just internally at SADA, making sure um, all of our underrepresented groups feel safe, but they also know how to advocate for themselves. They know how to express uh, what they're wonderful and, and, and how they are remarkable. Um, and and sort of really take their destiny, their career trajectory in their own hands. Yeah, that was sort of an, an eye-opening moment for us. But this concept that we could actually extend this to our own customers, which you know we win and talk to hundreds of new customers every year, and we have thousands of customers in aggregate, and we are already through our change management and training organization running systematic cultural change management, adoption and training programs mm -hmm. around the construct of, let's say, a Google workspace implementation, which 60% of which is about culture change anyway, or a GCP project, which a huge part of that is around engineering culture change, DevOps culture change, FinOps culture change. So this concept that we can actually layer in a level of influence that's beyond these things we've already been doing for years, but really takes our relationship and our strategic value to our customers to the next level in the realm that we're so passionate about around DEI, why would we not want to translate and transfer our own passion and understanding and really strategic advantage of leading with DEI to our own customers? Like that is a value proposition that's so immense in my view and in the eyes of our customers that it's also kind of very interesting because these are not things that MSPs and SIs were doing <laughs> in years past. Cloud has created such an interesting environment um, that allows us to deploy and implement new types of services altogether to our customers because all of our customers, Janet, you know, are hopefully customers for life. Like we live in this world of a perpetual relationship with our customers, right? It's consumption economics, it's subscription economics, it's value over time. So if you hope to be engaged with this customer for five, 10, 15, 20 years, 
layering in these types of things and, 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 and knowledge and services and capabilities and culture transfer becomes a very interesting opportunity and, and certainly uh, something that didn't exist a couple of years ago. And then oh, thank sure. you, Tony. I mean, we have to thank you for leaders like you and the partners like you that, that are doing that. Uh, Naomi, it's okay. I, I would like to jump in and, and tell you my I am remarkable story. Um, when I think about my career, and I've been doing this for 30 plus years, you know, myself and probably many other women out here, you know, we, we basically feel like if we work really hard and you know, keep our head down, um, take notes at every meeting, be the one to volunteer to plan the company picnic, and also take care of your kids and your parents at the same time, you, you feel like somebody's going to notice you and pick you out and give you that career you know, that you want, that escalation that you want for whatever job it is. And uh, what I found, the, the story that changed my life was I was uh, with someone that was a mentor of mine who was talking about this big job. My background was in retail CPG, and they wanted someone to move to headquarters and create the entire strategy, the go-to-market, the shows, the everything. And they kept talking about this job, and, and they couldn't find anybody for it. And this person, it was a man, said to me, um, well, I know who I want, but I know I could never get them. And I said, well, who is that? And he said, you. He goes, but you know, you're a mom. You've been here. You've lived in the city for 20 years. I know you'd never move. And it was that was my aha moment because uh, I basically said, well, no one's ever asked me to move. And for an amazing job like that, of course, I would consider that. And literally in three months, I moved my family all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast and since then have moved eight times in 16 years for bigger and better, more exciting jobs. And so my, uh, my biggest message is number one, your manager isn't a mind reader. So you have to know what you want and go for it. So my I am remarkable statement is after 20 years of doing it poorly, I am now very good at identifying what it is I want and telling as many people, sponsors, mentors, or allies as possible that can help me get to my dream role, which I feel like I am in today. Thank you, thank you, Jenna, for sharing that. And I think you highlight something else that we talk about during the workshop. We talk about men apply for jobs when they meet 60% of the criteria, whereas women mm -hmm. wait to meet 100% of the criteria. And you're a perfect role model of you know, somebody who didn't think that they could do it or was waiting to be told to do it. And thank you for sharing that. Um, Tony, can you share your I'm Remarkable statement? <laughs> Look, this is uncomfortable for uh, not just women or, or people from historically underrepresented groups, but it's, it's uncomfortable for many people. But um, I would say that uh, I'm remarkable for creating this amazing organization that's now 490 people or so that is culturally exactly the type of organization that I want to come to work in. It's based on our core values. Um, and it's, it's an environment that um, is safe and attractive and welcoming and supportive and loving um, because we're all competing for the best talent in the world. And we're all competing for high potential new people starting in their career who have ambition and drive and want to achieve great things. And to create an environment where, you know, 54% of our hires this year come from historically underrepresented groups, to work in an environment that not only teaches these types of programs to our individual contributors and, and, and new hires, but Top down, you know, mandates um, various or training for managers that they have to undergo um, just for being managers at SADA. Like we rolled out an amazing LMS program that has an entire track around DEI. Um, and we're running all these programs. I'm going to read some of them. So uh, every manager has to take this diversity, inclusion, and belonging for all uh, training on, on LinkedIn learning. Um, and we had 90% participation in the first round in this, in this training. Um, we also rolled out another, another topic that was required is called uh, unconscious bias, uh, the science behind unconscious bias in, in leaders. And I think um, other programs around inclusive listening. Um, so it's important to do these things sort of top down. Certainly it all 
feel like I feel like it starts with me. I have to set the best possible example, right? I set the tone, but and then cascades down to every leader that runs a team, but also from every level on up in terms of how to advocate them so, for themselves, like through the programs around I Am Remarkable and various partnerships with this WE organization and of course with the forum. I'm really proud of that <laughs> because it's it's just authentic. Like when you when you land and create an organization that has the culture that makes you proud, um, I'm really proud of myself for that, I have to say. But um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just really important. It, it's where I wanna come to work. And look, Janet, you know, you, we deal with customers all the time and they deal with a whole slew of challenges. DEI culture is something that we can actually control as leaders if we want to. And so if we can, in this hyper competitive, complex, fast moving world, I feel that we must. And that's why we're so excited about extending this to our customers and, and anyone else who will listen. But um, it's just such an amazing opportunity that every organization, if they took this seriously with intention, can create the type of place that many, many, many people want to come to work. And I think it's just foolish to do it in any other way because we're all trying to attract the best talent and create an environment where they're so happy and driven and motivated and proud that they're also going to translate that energy to the best possible customer experience mm -hmm. and how we engage with our customers and win in the market and compete and deliver impact for them, right? If, if our people within Google Cloud or SADA don't feel wonderful and energized and excited and safe and listened to and so on, how can they possibly then translate a differentiatedly excellent experience to our customers? They can't. So it's just, it's just very, uh, I'm very proud of that. And I think that's part of the reason why we've grown so consistently and we've continued to win in, in, in many, many places and many areas, but it's the journey's not done. I think part of this is um, the growth mindset that we all accept that we can always be better. And, and, uh, that's part of our DNA as well. And uh, uh, the journey is a continuous one. Totally. Uh, I, I love saying that at Google, not only do we open source our code, but we open source our culture. And it, it is too, truly humbling to take this culture to our customers. It's also quite incredible to watch Tony, you being part of uh, an I'm Remarkable workshop and taking it to all of your, uh, to, to all of your employees and, and Janet, your leadership taking it to all your leadership as well. Um, it, it's great to see it coming from, from the top down. Um, I think at this point, if it's okay, we're gonna take a few questions from, um, from the audience, if that's okay with you guys. Absolutely. Uh, um, Juliana would like to know, what is your advice for leaders that are starting in the DEI journey? I can start and then I'll pass you, Tony. You know, just like Tony just discussed at Google, you'll have a lot of opportunities for specific classes and courses. Some of them will be man mandatory, like the unconscious bias class as an example. But I would say for me, the thing that has been most impactful this year, and again, we've been through a lot this year just uh, in our world. We as a leadership team under Kristen Klapaus, who runs North America, every month we do a 90 minute DEI session and every month, and there's, there's only, I think, 15 of us in this, and we're, we meet like this virtually, and we take a tough topic. So we started the first time, it was a year ago, with Black Lives Matters, and we had speakers that had very different point of views that were uh, kind of in the front line versus, you know, people that might just be listening and learning, but we went from there to... Uh, we, we did the Canadian Indigenous situation that you may have read about in the press. We have talked about safety for women. We talked about LGBT. It's been really impactful. I think the learning for us is the big classes, the big forums, and thank you for those who came today. You, you, can, you can listen and learn, but it's when you're really talking in smaller groups, I think that you get breakthroughs. And so we found this to be a best practice in North America, and we're bringing it down from our leadership to the leadership in the regions and the, the industries. It would be probably the best practice I would share from you from what I've learned this year, uh, which was a, quite a different year for all of us. 
Tony? I think that the first few steps include um, undergoing the training yourself. Um, you know, when I when I went through the training and I thought, well, this is stuff that I probably already know, but it's actually very surprising. <laughs> the things you learn about yourself as you go through this training. And I'm not one into, I'm not like, a, I'm, you know, it's all about the squishy stuff. Like, no, I'm, 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 I care very much about execution and performance and those types of things. But it's, but it was so practical in the way that these trainings are presented that you're like, oh my gosh, like I do those things. I think I am, I, I'm guilty of some of these things, right? And, and, and unconscious bias and bias can be in all sorts of directions to so creating the self-awareness yourself. And of course, you know, getting certified and I am remarkable training yourself, um, spending time really uh, talking about it publicly. I think part of the, uh, the, the trauma of not only the pandemic, but of the George Floyd event and the, all the, these things happening right now in some states around the legislation that's going going down, I think, I don't know, Janet, if you feel about this, but um, as sort of a white male today, I feel like I also have, and all of our leaders have more of a platform and a license to talk about uncomfortable things. I think where in the past we used to maybe lean on, well, this conversation doesn't look belong in the business world. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's completely incorrect now. I think we all should be allowed to express how we feel about these sort of things and, and really leaning in that way as a leader. And you used the word safe earlier. And I think when you talked about what you felt you built with your company, it has to be in a safe environment. So we do need the uncomfortable conversations, but people need to have a safe environment to feel like they won't be judged and that they'll be heard. So totally agree, I totally agree. Uh, we have a question from Vivian. Vivian would like to know, what piece of advice would you give those who are looking to align with leadership and stakeholders to get buy-in and drive more DEI efforts to their, in the organization? Uh, I guess I'll start again and then pass to you, Tony. Uh, I would just say, you know, get involved. It was interesting that I am remarkable uh, program. I shouldn't even call it a program. It seems like it's now a, um, a mission or something that's just taken off like wildfire. Uh, those people that have gotten to be the trainers and then they're out working with customers, you know, the visibility, frankly, that you're getting, we're all seeing it. I mean, the number of, for the Google or so, the number of kudos that I've seen for people that have stepped up and talked about our program or, or ran a program for our customer or with our partners. Uh, you know, number one, I think you'll feel great about the experience and giving back for yourself. Uh, but also it's incredible exposure because people are seeing you walk the talk versus, you know, just raising a tough question in a all hands call. So that would that would be my my number one. But if there's something that you see that is not right or uncomfortable, I mean, please, you know, the doors are open. You should talk about it. We don't want a situation where people feel like they have to hide things that are uncomfortable. And I, I think that at Google, I know Tony at SADA, like we're all working so hard to have this space that you can have uncomfortable conversations and that we can talk about it and make things right. Yeah, Tony, I mean, to add to that, I, I think, um, sorry, Naomi, I think that uh, it's important to put these sort of learnings into practical use every day. I think that's how you lead and also get noticed by your leaders. I mean, in practice, what's actually going on in your organization? in meetings, in presentations, in groups? What is the composition of those groups? What kind of language are you using? Is one person being unknowingly offensive all the time, right? And, and, and I think a lot of the training is about actually resolving those things within the group, in your peer group, in your circle, in your teams, like kind of like see something, say something, but I'm not saying something escalate up. I'm talking about say something within your group, create an, a, 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 an environment that is safe to coach one another essentially in real time around the things that you feel like are suboptimal. Um, I never want to see a, a homogeneous group working on something. <laughs> That's not where the best execution is going to come from, right? So we'll like we'll, we mix up that team, uh, change the group, uh, hire differently, promote differently. These are important things that need to 
ultimately that's where the rubber meets the road of like what is a practical application of all this training and all these all the sessions of this week we hope that um, we all hope Naomi, Janet, and I that this gets translated into everyday practical steps that, in aggregate, over time, make a huge, huge impact. I'll tell you, five years ago, my sales team was like ninety-five percent dudes. <laughs> that was not good. Dudes is a visual in its own self, right? <laughs> And I think also to, to both of your points, it, when you see something, say something, don't assume that your leadership is aware that these programs exist. You know, as, as a member of the team, make sure that you bring these programs to your leaders and, and inform them and, and offer to, to run them for your leaders because, you know, they can learn as well. Absolutely. So, next question from Adrian. How should we act when we detect bias in a, le in a leader? And we'll let Tony start this time. The dude. <laughs> I think that, again, there's some level of presumed risk in what I'm about to tell you, right? But we hope, and I, and I encourage everyone to give the benefit of the doubt, and maybe I'm being idealistic, but I, I, every leader within SADA I know would be receptive to hearing feedback when they're not doing and saying the right things that are creating the most inclusive and safe environment. In fact, I'll tell you, some of our leaders who've been here with us for, for a decade or so, I've seen a huge change in them who are very old school and traditional and came from these you know, enterprise software backgrounds where certain things were acceptable. They have made the shift with not too much pressure, actually, just when it became the environmental norm and I set the expectations and we all adopted the expectations. You'll be surprised at, I think, the level of appreciation uh, good leaders will will express as, as if they're being called out in the right way, one on one, in the right environment. There's training on how to do this well. Um, we hope that uh, we we want it. I want it. If I'm doing something, saying something that's making people uncomfortable, I want to know. And I think every good leader does as well. Yeah, it's funny because now that we're doing so much work on all the different um, uh, areas, like I said, that we're doing one, I think we're eight into eight months right now with our leadership team. We kind of all call each other out and just some of them are little things. Like uh, I used to always open every call and say, hey guys, you know, well, there's guys and women in that call. So now my team will say, no, it's not guys, it's team. Hey team. I'm like, okay. Uh, I got I had another one though um, that I thought was really impactful. I was doing some round tables with some black Googlers and, and it was actually a little bit of, like around the I am remarkable, which is instead of just talking about the challenges in the workplace, uh, we were doing round tables to say, tell me what what you what you're proud of, your work, what work you're proud of, and what you want to be. Because again, if I don't know your aspirations, it's going to be hard for me when we're in uh, talent conversation succession plans to figure out you know who might want which roles. And uh, unfortunately at Google, you guys mostly know, we do 30 minute meetings, which are sometimes tough when you have really deep conversations. So we did a 30 minute call and then I'm like, this was a great call, you guys, I gotta run to my next meeting, thanks so much. And one of the attendees called me afterwards and said, you know, um, just my advice, that was really a great call, but the fact that you had to hang up, which I always have to hang up because we have that next call scheduled, um, it left, it made a great meeting the, uh, was that genuine? You know, did she really care? Because she was so she was so engaged for thirty for twenty nine minutes, and then the last minute I had to go. I, I so appreciated that. I mean, the real time feedback matters. But to the to the tougher question, because I know there's an underlining uh, point there. If you have had that conversation and given feedback to your manager in a way that. Like I said, I, I so appreciate those examples. You do need to tell somebody. I mean, if it's still, if it continues and it's not stopped, tell their manager's manager, tell your HR partner, you really do need to tell someone. You also need to know that we take every, um, every comment or every escalation very seriously and you are being protected. You know, you, you may or may not know this, but uh, when we have a claim, uh, your manager and your managers never know about it until there's something founding that we have to do something about. So it's a protected environment. And if it is not a good situation, you shouldn't just sit there and take it. You need to tell somebody. So. Thank you. I think we have time for one last last wrap up question or one, one last question. Catherine would like to know, how would you pr promote the diverse talent in your company? How would you promote the diverse talent in your company's for them to continue growing their careers and get better representation at the leadership level? 
Tony, you want to start? Yeah, I think this is amongst the the bigger challenges because it is really a long term play. And I know it feels sort of weird to say that there's no sort of instant, uh, you know, solution. But what I believe is that it's very possible to create an environment that casts a much wider net in terms of equity and opportunity. And I think part of what actually, again, try to find silver lining in this in this in this pandemic. Right. We've gone from hiring in 13 states and two provinces to now our employees represent 39 states and four provinces and four countries, right? Um, now we can hire from anywhere, in any community, any city, almost anywhere in the world. And I think casting that sort of a net is super, super important. Of course, we've also partnered with the National Society of Black Engineers, where we're sourcing talent for our incoming set of SADA U cohorts, right? That will hopefully be the engineering leaders of tomorrow. So sourcing talent from a wider net, casting a wider net, which now we have the license to do more than ever before because geography matters much less than ever before is, is certainly one of the strategies we're deploying very deliberately. And uh, I think it's uh, starting to work really well. And then from my side, it's it's not one strategy, it's multiple strategies. For example, when you're hiring, uh, you need to have a diverse panel of interviewers that look like the people you want to interview. You know, study after study says, you know, five white men are going to hire a white man. But if you have, you know, two women, underrepresentative talent on the same panel, a manager, you might get very different results. So it's how you hire. Um, second is you've got to have a company that people want to join. So, you know, there's a lot we can do in the market. Uh, there's a lot, you know, Google's obviously got a huge presence to show, to demonstrate Walk the Talk. This is a company where if you are minority or, or woman talent, you feel like you'll belong there. And then once you get here, we need to develop. And so we have significant development uh, programs. But I think the, the one that really makes the biggest difference is uh, assigning uh, mentor and ally, like allyship around. Uh, you have top talent, they're diverse, underrepresented women. Ask senior leaders to actually m mentor them. And mentoring someone means you have to see their work. You can't just have calls every month and say, you're great, I'm great. This is a great phone call. You actually have to see their work and give them real feedback. And you did this really well, but you could do this. And we have a lot of uh, things in Google. We could get you a coach. There's there's so many things you can do, but you it really is the three levels, getting them in the company, developing once they're here, and then identifying and really going over uh, and above and beyond to help people get to what they want to do from their aspirations at the company. Um, Thank, thank you so much. That, this has been an incredibly insp inspiring panel. I pre thank you both for joining I Am Remarkable Week. We look forward to our continued partnership between Google and SADA. Um, and please join some of the other panels that we're going to have this week. I'd also like to plug uh, a panel we're having tomorrow with Kirsten Cliphouse, um, who will be talking to uh, Shannon Johnson the, the, uh, of Global Payments. And thank you, Naomi. You were fantastic for being a I Am Remarkable leader. And thank you again, Tony. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on with us today. Likewise, Janet. Thank you so much. Uh, what an honor. Thank you, Naomi, for making this possible. Um, it's really, It's really incredible to be part of this week with Google.